The very second I walked into those doors, I knew I would do this the rest of my life. Hello, what's happening? And welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 538, with today's guest, Professor Mark Redding. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we're doing is in support of the traditional martial arts. What does that mean? If you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. I got an email just today from someone saying, I didn't realize all the different stuff you guys are doing. How are you doing all this stuff? And well, it's a combination of an amazing team and a lot of efficiency and getting up really early. So go to whistlekick.com, check out everything that we've got there. One of the things you'll see is our store. We've got a store. We sell some stuff. It's one of the ways we keep the lights on. So if you want to help us keep the lights on, make a purchase. Use the code PODCAST15. That saves you a little bit of money, saves you 15%, and lets us know that, yep, the podcast leads to some sales. So it's a good thing. Helps me justify it to some of the people I have to answer to. Other ways that you can help out, you can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. You can sign up for the newsletter at any of our websites. You can check out the books that we have available at Amazon, or you can support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. Dropped a post in there just today talking about upcoming guests and uh, something that might start happening soon, some behind the scenes stuff. If you really enjoy this show and you want to get the most out of it you can, Subscribe to the Patreon. You can start at two bucks a month. At upper tiers, we give you more exclusive free content. And make sure you're checking out the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got transcripts, photos, videos, links. We've got episodes arranged by style, by location, by chronology. There's a lot over there. And there's even a place to comment. So if you have feedback on episodes, that's the best place to leave it. Why do we do all this? Why do we make this show? It's to connect, it's to educate, it's to entertain traditional martial artists. And that's why we do different shows, different subjects. We're trying to give you a variety. I had a great conversation with today's guest. Professor Redding has been on one path from day one, and we talk about that, and it's blowing my mind how early this man knew he was destined to be what he is. And when you take a look at all he's done, all he's doing, it's awesome. We had a great conversation, such a positive, motivated person, and I think you're going to come away from this one fired up. I know I did. So here we go. Professor Redding, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Hey, of course. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for your generosity with your time. And, yeah, for and sure. I know people, people, people say that all the time, right? It's, it's almost, oh, thanks for being so generous with your time, but really... Uh, the older I get, the more time I spend in business, the more I realize like that's really the only currency we have is time. That's we true. We have money, which stores time mm -hmm. and creates more time and reminds me of a, a kind of cheesy Justin Timberlake movie from <laughs> 10 years ago. What was it called? In Time? Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, I mean, it's the reality, isn't it? You know, here we are, it it's is. 2020 and nobody knows how to spend their time anymore. We had plans and, <laughs> and they all got blown up. That's right. I got, I, I had a friend tell me the other day, but this was awesome analogy. He said, 2020 is like walking out on the street, looking both ways for a car and then getting hit by a plane. <laughs> That's exactly what it's been like. I like it. I like it. It's, I, we need, we need more of those. We need more <laughs> memes mocking what we're going through yeah. just, just to deal. Yeah, exactly. It's, hor it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And you know, I don't, I don't know, and we're, this is all going to unfold, but of course, when we, when we think about training, we talk about martial arts, mm -hmm. most places still aren't where they want to be. And we've got schools that are shut down. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. It really is. Thankfully, you know, I live in Texas, so it's, uh, it, it's not as bad as some of my friends that have schools you know, throughout the United States. So I, I'm very fortunate. At least we, we can get back to work and, and we have people still training and, and doing that. Yeah. yeah. Texas is big. Where are you? I'm in, I'm in Denton, Texas, which is about 30 to 40 minutes outside of Dallas. Texas feels like its own country. 
It does. I've been there a couple times. <laughs> it is. It's a huge place, man. You can go twelve hours one direction and not even be out of Texas. I, my 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 Texas anecdote. So uh, our our product warehouse um, mm-hmm. is in Texas, and the first time I went there, flew into Houston and had to drive down to Rockport. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, near near Corpus Christi for mm-hmm. people who might be outside of Texas, may not know Texas well. I certainly don't know Texas well. And before I left, a friend of mine said, watch for the cactus. Watch for the cactus. What, are you, what are you talking about? But I don't, I don't. And here, here I am three hours into a five hour drive south. And I went, oh, a cactus. I went, oh, that's what she's talking about. Because it was the flattest, straightest, most boring road I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, we we could probably talk about Texas and the coronavirus and <laughs> pandemics and business and a whole bunch of other things that I'm sure would be interesting. And maybe we even get to some of that stuff. But I want to rewind the tape. I want to go back. It's a martial arts show. You're a martial artist. At some point, you became a martial artist. So what was that zero point for you? Okay, so this is a, this is a crazy story, but um, it's one that uh, is all true. So I'll start you at the beginning and let I you know. I love crazy stories. And the truest <laughs> ones are always the craziest. Okay, so it, here's, how it, here's how it played out. So I, I've never done any sports. I didn't do basketball, baseball, nothing like that in through school. Now, when I was a kid, my folks put me in, uh, I believe, like T-ball. And I, might, I might even play soccer. I don't remember. I was so little. But in, in the years that I can remember when I was in junior high, going into high school, I never did any sports. And, um, you know, I just I, I was never really interested in that. I didn't have any hobbies. And uh one day, my dad, he came to me and said, you know what, Mark, we're going to, I'm going to do uh, this martial art class. And I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. And I was like 13 at the time. And he said, you know what, you're going to go with me. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going with you to do that. Typical 13-year-old, I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do what my parents say. I don't want to do that. And he said, no, you need to come with me and uh, go to this class and just see what you think about it. And I was like, all right, whatever. So I load up in the car with him, and I go and I go to his karate class, and it was Shornaru Karate is what uh, he was doing. So I, uh, I open, or he opens the door, we get in the car, we head that way, have a little talk on the way, we get to the gym, and we walk in, and the very second I walked into those doors, I knew I would do this the rest of my life. I was 13 at that point. I just turned 43 last week, and uh, I have, in a nutshell, I've run my own business. I opened my own school at 19. I never went to college. I like I said, the moment I walked in, I saw that. I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. This is what my passion is. And I hadn't even done the class yet. So I finished the <laughs> class and I knew that was it. And to that day, since I was 13, now I'm 43, I've never missed a week of training ever. I've flown all over the world. I have done multiple martial arts. I've been to have the privilege of uh, training with the best people in the world and uh, getting to live this this crazy life of now in February, it'll be 30 years I've been doing martial arts, and uh, I get the chance to to live this this dream until someone comes and wakes me up and says, "Hey, you gotta go to go get a real job." So I am um, I'm super fortunate to say the least. There are a few things we're gonna go back and unpack there. Okay, <laughs> first right. off, wow. All right, that feeling. Mm-hmm. Now I I've, <laughs> I've felt that feeling on things. I did, you know I started training when I was too young to remember feelings. So I can't say that I had that. So I can't, I can't empathize there, but I've had that feeling about other things. You know, you meet certain people and you say, you know, that person is in my life for a reason. They're significant. I'm going to hold on to them, whether it's romantic or, or not. You, you travel to certain places. I think most of us have felt something like that at some point in our lives. Any idea what it was in that moment, what you were missing or looking forward to can you can you bring us to that moment and help us understand you know it's funny you ask that because my my wife and i talk a lot about this sometimes and she says uh she's like mark you 
you've got to realize how rare it is that someone at that age finds something and that's what they did the rest of their life. Most people don't do that. I mean, literally at 13, I found it. At 14 and 15, I would sit in the back of my classes in junior high reading business magazines and martial art magazines trying to figure out how I was going to open my school. I, I just knew this is it and this is all I've ever wanted to do. And what's even crazier is still 30 years later, I'm even more passionate about it than when I walked in the door to begin with. It's um, it's. I don't know if I can pinpoint it and just say I, I really believe that um, you know you believe in higher powers and whatnot. I mean, I do, and I, I believe that uh, I I was put there that day for a reason, and uh, I'm one of those very few people that uh, that gets to look at something at an early age and found it. You know what's crazy? I also think about this too: is how many people I look at this with my students? How many people out there? Don't go try martial arts or any other thing, you know, whatever uh, hobby or sport it may be, and that might be their thing. They have no idea. That could be the thing that they were waiting on to walk in the door. I just so happened to be so lucky that I was put in that spot. Bam, I walked in, and that was what I was supposed to do. I didn't find it at 43. I found it at 13. It's amazing. I have this theory that we all have one thing that we could do better than anybody else. And you, you can you can probably think of some people who, who fit that mold, you know, certain pro athletes or anybody who's ever worked with Bill Wallace knows that man oh, yeah. found his calling. I worked with him to as well. Pull someone, he's, a, he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody to pull somebody from the martial arts community. But like you said, most people don't try enough things. That's and true. It requires some, whether you want to call it divine intervention or something else to mm -hmm. say, here is your path. Now, I, I, want to, I want to go back even a little bit before. Yes, sir. So I, I have this theory that martial artists are filling a, a hole. The, for, for those of us where martial arts really resonates and really becomes our life pursuit, there's something that wasn't there prior to training. Mm -hmm. Any idea what that might be for you? Um... No, that's a that's a hard question. That's a good question. I, I my parents were great people, man. That they, they 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 raised me very well, and I, I feel like I had lots of opportunities. But um, if you say you're asking something, if I was missing something or not, I, I don't I don't know if it was that so much as that. Whenever I I'd walk into the room and just the concept of the idea of knowing that wow man i can actually learn a a way to defend myself a way that i can have my mind actively be pursued on something positive which i think a lot of people miss that when they look at martial arts these days because nothing against mma and all these other awesome amazing arts but when people walk in the door they don't realize that uh, this is a positive positive influence on so many people around you and yourself you know and it could be lots of things you could get into that are not that way but um this is something that the longer you do it the more you start to see wow man there's this this has kept me out of a lot of trouble you know yeah so maybe it's the feeling of that maybe it's just the feeling of the belonging you know belonging to something bigger than yourself and that, that's another thing i tell my students to this day is like you're part of something bigger than you you know, understand that no matter what art you do, I look at, I don't look at it as in specific arts. I never have. I'm always, I'm a martial artist, you know, so I look at like, um, you know, the best way to, to approach it is to say, look, you know, I walk in here, I get to train this, this amazing art. You know, you want to make sure that you, know, you I hate the word give back. I'm not giving back to, to that but uh, I want to make sure that it's respected and that people look at it and go, oh, yeah, okay, this is, this is something that's bigger than me. This is bigger than what I could ever accomplish by myself. You know, another way to say it is, you know, I, I like this. I heard this the other day. I wrote it in my notes. I said, the reward of doing martial arts is doing martial arts. That's, that's exactly what it is. And that's why I think when I step on the mat every single day, I'm like, this is my reward of doing this. I can do the martial arts. It's kind of meta. You know, it is, man. You can I mean, unpack that a lot. And if you go, I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding going too deep on it because it's starting to, to make my brain hurt, but I can, I can see there's a lot of depth there. You know, I, I tell you, where, where I heard that, I, I'll say, because I'm, 
this Please. is great. I, I like people to, to, I study all the time, but, uh, and I'm really into music as well. I don't play music, but I like to listen to it in all different genres, just like I do martial arts. And, um, actually Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters said that and he wasn't talking about martial arts. He was talking about drumming. Okay. And he was just saying like, if you want to be really good, you know, he goes, be suck, be okay with sucking, get in a garage, you know, and get, get your instruments and, and suck for a really long time, but be okay that you're doing music. And I, I thought this is the same thing as martial arts, man. Yeah. People walk in the door and they want to be black belt, you know, they want to do this. But what I try to tell the students after I listen to that, I was like, man, be okay sucking. You're going to suck. We all suck when you first start, but that's the fun part of the process because you are doing the martial art. That's the reward of sucking. You get a chance to do something amazing and all of us can do it. No matter what your skill level, no matter what your color, no matter how much money you make, no matter how tall you are, whatever, everyone can do martial arts. And that's the reward. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, Dave Grohl, uh, despite, you know, I'm, I'm, I have an appreciation mm -hmm. for Nirvana. I have an appreciation for the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. I like Dave Grohl. I'm, I would not call myself a fan, but mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to get this quote and here it is. Musicians should go to a yard sale and buy an old yep. drum set and get in the garage and just suck and get their friends yeah. to come in and they'll suck too. And then they'll start playing and they'll have the best time they've ever had in their lives. And all of a sudden they'll become Nirvana because that's exactly what happened with Nirvana. Dude, a bunch of guys so, that had some old instruments. That is playing. exactly the interview I watched. I watched him talking about it and he's right. And I thought about that same thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say, Oh yeah, um, Dave Grohl's a, a huge rock star. I'm not saying that, but, but Dave Grohl had a passion too. He, 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 he liked to play the drums and be in the music and he never thought he was going to be huge. I never thought I was going to have a school for 24 years. I never thought that. I never thought, hey, man, I'm about to, you know, we're, we're coming into our 25th year anniversary of running this academy. I never, ever thought of that. I thought, this is my passion. This is what I want to do. And I was okay. I mean, I started off my mom's garage when I was like 15, building my own gym there. And I ran these flyers to all these people in the neighborhood to see if someone would let me come teach them. And only there's one lady, and she brought her grandkids that were there for the summer from a different state. They weren't even from my own state. And that's where I started at. And I was like, this is amazing. I didn't care. I was like, I was just so happy someone wanted me to teach them. And I got a chance to do that. And man, from there to where I'm at over 250 students now is, is, is amazing. I'm, I'm, I did the same thing as him in a different kind of way, in an artistic way. You know, it's just, it's really cool. Something neat to relate to. Well, what I'm hearing, and, and I think this is important, whether you, the, the folks listening, whether your dream is to pursue a martial arts school or to be recognized as one of the best drummers of all time mm -hmm. or to do anything else is to lead with that passion because mm -hmm. you're in order to get great, you have to suck. You do. And, and if you, you know, don't enjoy the process, you're not going to make it past the part of sucking. You are 100% correct. And I want to add something to this too, because I was talking to a friend of mine the other day on the phone and he's just starting his school. And I asked him for a couple of bits of advice and he goes, Mark, what is, what's, what's some advice? They all, everybody wants this one thing. Oh, Mark, what, what is this that you could do that can help me be successful? And I said, you know what, man, in my opinion, what people want is they want your passion. When someone walks in my door, they, they, they say they may want a black belt. They may say they want to learn how to fight and defend themselves, good in shape, whatever. And, I, and those are all things that are valid and which people want. But at the end of the day, I believe it's people want what I feel about this martial art. Like, why am I so excited about it after 30 years? People are missing that in their lives. And you know what? Everyone can have that. It doesn't matter if you are a world champion, if you are beating everybody in class, if you're not getting beat, if you're getting beat by everybody in class, you can still have passion. No one can take that from you. Why do people go to concerts? Absolutely. You can listen to a more accurate, better sounding recording of the same music at mm -hmm. home. That's right. And you don't have to spend any money and you don't have to bump into people and spend four hours getting out of the parking garage but you won't be around the passion. That's right. The energy. The energy is so, so important, man. I mean, you can feel that in, uh, in, in the martial arts for sure, you know, because it's such a personal thing with someone that you're training with. So that passion is what led you in the back of the classroom at 15 years old to start reading business magazines. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Oh, magazines. Man, I, I read so many books. I, I Books and magazines. I'd read so much on Zig Ziglar. I read a lot on Brian Tracy. I read a, a lot on Tom Hopkins. I read a lot on Anthony Hop, or Anthony, um, Anthony, who's, uh, just, just the name's the word, I don't know. Um, I read a lot on different, just different people that would put in kind of like a, I'm the type of person that I like to see it in, in uh, kind of laid out in front of me so I could pick and choose what would work for me. I, I don't like to take everyone's you know, idea and say, hey, I want to take that and I'm going to go off and copy this person. I want to see what they did and then pick and choose what I want out of it and go the next thing. And that's exactly how I did my career in martial arts. I, I have black belts in six different arts that I've trained in and done, and I've picked what I want out of each of them. And then I go on to the next thing, which is what I think you're supposed to do. And I say next thing, I don't mean quit that. I, I, I still practice all the arts I'm black belt in, but I, along the way, I never thought of like, oh, I'm going to get black belt in this, black belt in that. I thought, I want the information. Show me this information. How can I get that? Where did this come from? What book can you t suggest to me that I could read that might I get one little piece of that information that I can apply to what I'm doing, whether it be my business, whether it be my martial arts or, or whatnot. So that's kind of where I started with it. And um, I've always been an avid note taker. I, I I believe in writing down your goals, you know, writing down and I, I just take it a step further. I um I'll tell you this, this is, this is a little bit on a sidetrack, but I, before I started teaching full time, I had my school, but I was working a couple jobs because I didn't have enough students to be able to do it full time. So I'd work a few jobs. And I remember one job was about an hour away from where I lived. And so I took a picture of my current, of the school I was in at that time on the outside of it. And I put that picture on my dashboard. And I look at that picture every day on that drive to work and that drive home telling myself, hey, this is what you're going to do full time. This is it. This is what's going to happen. And man, it became a reality. It's not something I just thought, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, I wrote notes on it. I, I was, I'm a very visual person. And I think that martial artists need to see that. That's, that's a lost thing. I don't see a lot of people taking notes. They're always on their phone or videoing it now. I mean, writing it down. I still, after 25 years of running my business, I work off of a chalkboard that I had when I was 19 when I opened my school. Still, still to this day, I just literally, before we call this call, I was writing some things on it. Still, and I think that's what, um, I think that's a lot of, of the part of my success is that I, I've been able to work from that kind of, um, that kind of a format. And I don't think a lot of people do that. Uh, with that also being said though, I mean, I'm up here early. Yesterday I was up here at 6 a.m. I left at 8 p.m. yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I work a lot, but I, I love this. This is not work because this is my passion. This is what I get to do. I get to share this every single day. And I'm fortunate enough that people keep coming back to let me do that. So you started with Shorinru, you said? I started with Shorinru Karate when I was 13. Okay. I got my and... black belt with that at 18. Yeah. Right. And I'll tell you a story about that too, Please. if you don't mind. Um, no, no, th this, this is, is your episode. You, you, you drive the show. I'm, I'm happy to hang back and just, you know, yeah, chime I, in I, once in a while. I, I want to learn about you. I tell you, um, I was saying earlier in the interview, I couldn't think of the name. Anthony, it's Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins. I read a lot of his stuff too. I went to one of his seminars too, which was amazing. Um, super, super informative. But anyway, back to the, you know, get my black belt. My, my first black belt, I got when I was 18 years old. Okay, it was 1995. That's when I got my first black belt. And and working my way up through the ranks when I was a kid, I um I thought, well, that's what's gonna happen. You know, you're gonna get the black belt, and it's gonna be some magical is gonna happen. I'm gonna have all this skill. And I remember getting my black belt, and I went back to my uh, my girlfriend's house at that time. I remember sitting on her couch, and I was like, that's it. That's all I got. I mean. Well, what is this? And she was like, you know, Mark, what are you so upset about? So I'm not really upset. I'm just kind of let down. She's like, what do you mean? What are you let down for? I said, I don't know. I was just expecting something different, you know? And she was like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go do some more. I'm going to find another art. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep diving, keep going deeper and deeper. And I realized what I was feeling at that time was like, like the old adage says, you know, you, you work, you get to this black belt level and you realize that, oh man, you really don't know anything. And that, that's exactly how I felt. And that's exactly how I feel today. After 30 years, I, I, I have, I'm 
second degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm an eighth degree black belt in Kempo Karate. I am a first degree black belt in Shoin Ru. I have instructorships in uh, Thai boxing. I have a full instructorship in Jeet Kune Do. I, I've done a lot of things, but I honestly feel like I am a beginner. 100%. And I encourage people to come in. I love having my students that are constantly learning and getting better. And I want to learn. From that. I want people to show me how to do that. I think that's a, that's a big thing, you know. I call it the, the white belt mentality. Absolutely. You yep. know, for, for those who forgot what it was like, or you know, maybe you were too young, or maybe you've been training the same thing for a long time. To me, there is no better feeling than stepping in with nothing but opportunity mm -hmm. and no responsibility, no expectations. That's right. Because you can just learn so much. You just get to be a sponge. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, though, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. when you were in your first black belt, it mm -hmm. was not common for people to just pick up and shift to a different art. Was that no. something that came... It wasn't through your instructor, through your Shorn Ru instructor, or was that um, philosophy you'd read about? Where did that come in? I think that's funny you said that because I think that was really common in that time. You, you gotta, and I tell my students this too, they, they don't realize, I, and I'm happy. I, I want to give my students more. It's like they're like my kids. I want to give them more than I ever had coming up. That's, that's my number one thing whenever they, they are part of the academy. But they got to understand too, you know, 25 years ago, it was kind of looked bad upon to go train in their art. It was definitely looked bad upon if you went train with a different school. Oh, forget about that, man. You're, you're, you're like, you know, breaking codes by going to do that. And I never had that mentality. My, my first instructor, he was always welcoming saying, Mark, you know, go, go experiment here and go show this or go learn this and come back and show what you, what you learn. So I was, I was lucky to have that at the beginning stages. And then honestly, I would say all my instructors, looking back on it, there's maybe a couple that didn't agree with me training at other places. But now, after all the years have passed, I mean, I think they understand why. And I also think that they do the same thing now. Uh, and that's, that, that shows positive growth in the martial art. And people don't, don't see how that, where that came from. You know, um, I, I've always been an advocate of that. I, I, it's another thing I... I want to tell people that are listening on the website or on the, on the podcast is that some martial artists, I, I, and it seems to be more traditional side. And I can say that because I, I have black belts in traditional arts that I came through that same uh, lineup. But um, a lot of those people, you know, they, when they would teach you, they would, I heard it myself, um, students or other black belts in the class would say, Mark, you know, why are you wasting your time learning these other arts? You know, just stick with just this because this is the best art. You know, I'm like, there's, you know, I, I'm a seeker of knowledge, man. I don't, I don't, I have no, no one group of putting my eggs in one basket. And most people think that all I do is jujitsu. I love jujitsu. I think it's an amazing art, but that is not the best art. In, in my opinion, I think that there's not a best art. I think that they all have something very special. It'd be like asking me, Mark, which one of your kids is your favorite? Well, it changes day to day. It's the same thing with my with martial arts. You know, some days I don't want to do jiu-jitsu. Some days I want to do Filipino martial arts. Some days I want to come in and work on Kempo. Some days I want to do Thai boxing. I don't know. It just depends on what, what I feel like I want to work on that time because there's so much behind all those arts that you could study a lifetime doing that you would never pick it all up if you just pick one. And I have five or six that I play around with. So, you know, or that I'm lucky to be able to practice and learn in that art. As you were saying that, there was something that really struck me. You know, we and and this is this is so deep. It's so cliche. It's in in all of the the best worst martial arts movies. These claims that you know this style is best. Mm -hmm. Imagine someone saying this is the best hamburger ever. That's right. And <laughs> never having eaten another hamburger. Yeah, I agree. This is the best car. How many cars have you driven? Well, this is my first car. Mm -hmm. It's ludicrous. It is. It's insane. And you would never do that. It's in irrelevant. Life. Yeah. Because that's not the point. It's right? not. And it sounds like, like it was your recognition of that that led you to go broader and try different things. Now, you, you said something that I, I really like, that you want to give your students more than you had. Absolutely. That's the number talk, one thing. Talk, talk to me about that. What does that mean to you? How does that manifest? 
Okay, so uh, let me let me kind of dial back a little bit and say, like, you know, when I started, I was I started in my mom's garage. Okay, and I I built this um, you know group of people that I was training, and then my dad made a comment to me one time when I was a kid. I I was already a black belt. I was I was gra- I graduated the year I graduated high school. I got my black belt. And he made a comment to me and said, Mark, you, my job as a parent is to make sure that uh, you are on the path you need to be to what you want to do for your life. And he's like, what do you want to do? I said, I want to teach martial arts. That's it. And he's like, okay. You know, and he's self-employed as well. So he, he understood, you know, that kind of mindset. So I didn't get that. Those parents are like, you're crazy. I can't believe you would do that. But anyway, he guided me. He's like, look, let me help you get started with this. So he helped me and he helped me get a place and uh, get everything set up to start teaching my classes. I had other jobs to run it, but he helped me get this, this, this school going and then to feed this passion. So I came from a garage and then I, I went to three different schools and then I ended up buying my own place 10 years ago. All right. Each place I've gone to, I've improved a lot. So I would, you know, it was was not the greatest place in the first place. And then we we put our touch on it, cleaned it up, make it look better, better, better. Well, each place has offered more to the students. All right. So now I'm currently in the process of building a brand new building that uh, luckily we have two schools in my town and we're consolidating a a brand of a building. I'm building a building from scratch, all right? And it's going to have all the -the state-of-the-art things in there for people that want to come in and train uh, martial arts. And this is... This is my thought on that, all right? I want to have a facility. When you walk in the door, at the same time, you have Filipino martial arts teaching. Same time, judo is going on. Same time, jiu-jitsu is going on. Same time, karate is going on. Same time, people are lifting weights. Same time, people are training on the training apparatus on the side. Same time, people are studying the martial arts in the library. Same time, people are doing private lessons. I want all of this going on at the same time. I want my students, I don't think it's anywhere in the world. I don't think anybody has. I've never seen it. I've traveled all over the place. I want my students to walk into a facility like that and go, wow, this is, this is a university. This is some place I can come and learn. That is the the ultimate gift I can give back to all my students. And I don't think they even see it yet, but it's coming. I'm going to have that soon. And they'll be able to look at that and go, wow, I had an amazing experience one time with the martial arts. Not so much for me. I don't need someone to thank me. I just want them to look back on martial arts and go, man, I went to a martial arts school that I was fortunate to be able to experience all these arts as a whole. That sounds phenomenal. And uh, let let me know let me know when it's up and running because I'm going to move in. Man, come on! And that's another thing. We'll have dorm uh, rooms in the place. So th- th- my my plan to, is to have it done by the end of next year, in the fall of next year. And um, but that's it. People can travel in and and see and teach a seminar on what they want and have a place to stay at the gym while they're there over that time. You know, it's kind of like a residency. You know, and that's that to me is like the ultimate thing I could give back to martial arts from what it's given me. Powerful. Yeah, that's, powerful. That's the point. What? What comes up for you emotionally when you talk about that? Um, talk about what the just just this this idea of investing so much and creating something so unique. You know, I don't take this the wrong way because I don't I don't mean this at all. But I um I've worked really hard, really hard, and I've sacrificed quite a few things to be able to get to where I'm at. And I've put martial arts first. Uh, and times when I shouldn't have, you know, clearly, um, it is the only thing I've ever wanted to do period. So I, when you ask me like what that feels like to do something like that is, um, it is emotional. It, it's, it's very, uh, emotional to me because I have such a deep love for martial arts and I want everyone to be able to experience that. And not just that, I want to leave a legacy behind that there's a place for people to go, the people that can continue to run that or to continue to experience that, you know, when I'm, when I'm past, you know, because really it, it's given me so much. It's, it's given me mindset. It's given me health. It's given me family, you know, it's given me so many things that I could never give it back. I could never give back enough to any martial art that I've practiced that, that it's given me. And, um, um, and to be able to share that with someone else, to get them to have a glimpse of that, man, that's uh, that's the ultimate gift I think I could I could give to somebody. I get it. Well, believe me, I get it. 
I am, I am right on board. So it sounds like we are motivated by the same thing. Absolutely. That's awesome. What does your school look like now? If, if that's the evolution, you know, what, mm -hmm. what's going on currently? Okay, so currently we have two schools and they are five minutes apart. And I get a lot of people ask me questions. Why, why do you have two schools that are five minutes apart? Wouldn't you want to spread them out across town? That wasn't my strategy. You know, my strategy was I'm going to I have one school that we've had for I've been at this location now for uh, 10 years or so. And I outgrew this place probably eight years ago. OK, so I've been running at, at full tilt for a long time. So I went out and rented another spot five minutes away. It's the same size of space. I thought, let's see how quick it'll take before I can get that one completely full. It, I didn't even open that one, and I had it full too. And I think what works so well is that when people come in the door, I'd say, okay, look, this is the place you're going to train here at this location. Once I got that class full, I'd say, hey, I'm going to do the same time. I'll put a different instructor at other school five minutes away, right down the road. This is your class. We're doing the same thing, but I couldn't put everybody together and have the space to do that. So I just made it happen five minutes apart. So, and that, that's been working amazing. I mean, it's, it's great. But now it's time to consolidate. It's I, I had to come to a I came to a, a, a crossroads because um, luckily I I'm 43 and I I save my money very well. I, I read all these business books coming up. Fortunately, I, I did I did some good things and uh, I could just retire if I wanted to. You know, I, everything's almost paid off. I, I, I'm in a really good spot. So it was, I had to sit down and think about it. I was like, Marcus, you're 43. You know, you, you, you're not ready to retire, retire. When I say retire, I mean, come into class and just train and not teach all the time. Have one day for me to teach, have my instructor teach the other days. Just have a good time, no privates. Just, just really enjoy um, the idea of not running a business, but just coming in and, and training. So I thought, you know, it's too young to do that. I can't do that yet. So what, what do you want to do here? And the next logical step, I, I always I try to push the boundaries. It's like, you know, we've got to consolidate. We've got to make a bigger space. We've got to make something that is not out there. I, I want to leave something behind that hasn't been done before. You know, of course, make, make sure you understand this is not just me. When I say I, I have a list of people behind me that are, that are right there. that are helping me. Fortunately, I've been able to run into these people and have them as mentors and people along the way that have uh, guided me and given me great suggestions that uh, can help make this reality. And that's... That's the only way you can do it. You can't really do it on your own. But uh, I've built those relationships in the times I've been in the martial art. You know, that's another thing that's given to me. You said a couple things in there. You used a couple different phrases that said roughly the same thing to me, that you, how do I want to put this, maybe don't always take the, the easy, well-traveled path. I never You're have. Like carving, okay, yeah, <laughs> got never that have. one right then. Yeah. All right. Where else does that way. manifest for you? Um... What else does it manifest by taking the well, hard kind of road? Where else? You know, we, um, for example, I've spent a total of, of six months in my professional career working full time for someone else. You know, I've always had my own businesses. Uh, that's certainly not the easiest thing mm -hmm. to do. Uh, when we started Whistlekick, you know, when you look at everything that's gone into that, certainly wasn't the easiest business that I could have started. Yeah. Uh, and, and so on and, and so forth. You know, I like to carve out my own way. And it sounds like you do that too. Of course, you're, you, you did that by starting your own martial arts school at, I think you said 19. Yeah, and 19. here you are. And you're, you're, you're not just, you know, 30 years after starting martial arts, kind of riding along and enjoying life. You're not even doubling. It sounds like tripling down mm -hmm. on what you've got going on. Again, Absolutely. not the easiest way to, to, to do it. So I'm curious. Are there any stories from, from life or competition where maybe that didn't go well or, uh, you know, or maybe, I, maybe it did unexpectedly? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you this. I'll tell you this is kind of a unique story that I don't know of many people have done this. But I, um, when I wanted to learn jiu-jitsu and jiu Kundo, I went to a, um, I went to a seminar in Indiana. Okay. I flew out there. I wasn't old enough to drive a car. So I, or to rent a car. So I took a cab from Indianapolis airport to Richmond, Indiana. That's about an hour one way. That's an expensive cab ride. 
Okay. And I went out there and did a seminar. I was like, okay, this is, uh, this is cool. Uh, I'm really enjoying this. I, I, I like the jiu-jitsu aspect. I like the JKD aspect. Well, I need an instructor. So I met someone out there, and that was uh, his name is Jack McVicker. Is one of my, it was my first instructor in Jeet Kune Do and in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He did both. I was like, this is a nice guy. This is where I'm gonna start going. So I started flying to Indiana every three months with my brother, and I did that for 14 years. Okay, was it the easy route? Absolutely not, because I had a just a school that could have that just opened up in my town about 30 minutes away. But I chose to get airplane tickets, go out there, stay with this guy, learn how to do this. Then he was fortunate enough to say, Mark, you know, let's go travel here. Let's go do this. And I flew all over the world with him and learned how to travel, which is another thing that's uh, a whole other story, learning how to travel in martial arts. Um, but anyway, I, I did all that. And um it was definitely not the easiest route, but it was, I would not take that back for anything. It, it shaped me to who I am to this day. It, I've made some amazing friends that I still talk to over 20 years. I've known them and trained with them and built these friendships and bonds um, that you couldn't, you couldn't have ever told me that, hey, Mark, if you can go back, I'll put you over here and you can train with this guy and get you to a higher level or a belt faster versus what you went through. Cause that was, um, it's an amazing experience, hard way, but I believe sometimes, man, some, sometimes those hard routes that you take are, um, not only meant to be, but I also believe that, uh, you know, they are the most rewarding. I get it. Yeah. Everything we've talked about today has been really positive and uplifting and and maybe not the easiest way forward, but it's been pretty remarkable. It, it, it is not, but you know, you know why it makes it that way is because of passion. That's it. Right. The passion makes everything worthwhile. It makes it worse. That's why I told you at the beginning. It's like, that's what you want to give your students. Whatever art you teach, they want the passion behind what you're teaching them. And if they can have that, man, that you, you give them unlimited possibilities. So how about an example of something where it didn't go well, but the passion either made it worthwhile or it was a great learning experience or it wasn't as bad as it could have been? Honestly, I haven't had an experience like that. There's nothing no, no, I've no, done. No rocky times? No, no how am I going to no. pay the light bill at the dojo this month? Nothing? No. I, I have – I'm going to be honest. I, I, every year I've been open, I've done better than the past year. Every year in 25 years, I've never had a down time. Fortunately, even during the COVID that's going on, I've, I've been able to have my business for that long. I have some amazing students that stood by my side and still paid through that time, was able to keep the doors open. And then when we we're open back up, more people signed up. So that's, that is another reason that uh, I, I feel like I have to move forward and make this, this, this new mecca of a, of a martial art facility for people that um, they can come in because I, I know it's, it's, it means so many things to different people. But um, I, it also goes back to that first day when I walked in at 13. This is what I was put here to do. This is it. I knew that from day one. I still know that. And I have had an amazing road. I, I've had no – I mean, everybody has – you know, yeah, there's good days and bad days, and don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've had lots of people cancel, and you know, had much. But I, I have also that's that's not the big picture. The big picture is, hey, I'm still staying here for 24 years later, going on 25 years, and I still have people walking in the door. I still have people signing up. I still have people that are passionate about coming to train here. I still have instructors that want to pass on to other people. And man, that that's um, that you can't tell me that wasn't I wasn't put here for that. You know what I mean? It was just something put me to do this, and I feel like I need to, to live it out. Yeah, and that seems really clear. To say it another way, you're constantly looking forward. You're looking at improvement. You're focused on the positive. Always. You're doing a lot of these things that we're all taught to do and know we're supposed to do, and maybe we aren't as good at doing. That's true. That's true. You know, you, it's, it is, man, life is about learning. And, you know, you as a martial artist, uh, and we as martial artists are fortunate that we are in an art that we can always learn in we, and, and look outside of that and say, hey, you know, what can this do for me? I tell you, another little tangent, what martial arts done for me uh, two years ago, I, um, I started reading a lot about stoicism. 
Okay. And I was like, I want to, want to learn about this. So I started reading all these different books. And I was like, this is, this is amazing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fly to Europe and I'm going to go do a stoicism uh, workshop in middle of London is where I went. And I'd, Talked to my wife. I was like, this is what we're going to do. She's like, Mark, you are crazy. I was like, yep, you're going to go with me. So we flew to London and we did this course on this and on stoicism. And man, I, I started really studying it and learning it. And I was like, this is, this is amazing. This is, I can apply this right to my martial arts. And uh, I, looking back on that, man, that was one of the best experiences I had not just for myself with my wife and being able to carry that on and in my teachings and in my beliefs and, uh, you know, that would never have happened without the passion for martial art. No way. I never would have picked up the, my my phone and go, you know, I'll buy some tickets and just go to London. You know, that sounds like a cool place to go see. Let's go see what they're doing over there. Now, you've done some competition, haven't you? I have. I've competed a lot, you know, throughout okay. my, my time. Well, and all arts, not just jiu-jitsu. I've done it, and I don't know how much you know about the uh, Kempo Karate, but I am um, – I am an eighth a degree bit. I'm an eighth degree black belt in Kempo Karate, and uh, I started off. I actually, I started off doing karate competitions in, in Choi and Rue when I was in my teens. But then I went to the Ed Parker International Karate Championships when I was. I probably was still in my teens around that time. I fought in that. And that's then, the famous one in Long Beach. And Long California? Beach, that's right. Yeah. yeah, my dad took me out there with my brother, and we. Uh, I fought in that, and then. And then I got into jiu-jitsu, and then I tra- I've traveled all over the world competing in jiu-jitsu. I've been to Japan, Europe, all across the United States, fighting, competing, uh, doing seminars. I mean, it's just been it's been an amazing ride. It's, it's been very fortunate, for sure. What does competition mean for you? Um, I think it's a place that you can go out there and, uh, you know, you can do something that is solely on you. It's, it's whether good or bad, whether win or lose, that's something that you are responsible for and um, why you're on the mat. Now, the training to that, there's two sides because the training to go to do that, you need your team. You need people that are willing to help you because no one can do it on their own. But when you actually step on the mat and it's just you and the other person, then what the training has been for with the people that have helped you is what helps come out. So it's twofold. Um, I, I think it teaches you a lot about yourself. I think that um, I think everyone should experience it, you know, whether they like to compete or not. I think they should go out there and try that for sure. Um, I'm a very competitive person naturally. I mean, I, I if you look at my business side, I I I want the best. I want to I want to work the hardest for it. I want to be the one that no one's outworking me. Uh, and the same kind of mindset as a competitor, I would never be. Someone you say, hey, Mark, why do you compete? Oh, just for the experience. I don't do that for the experience. I do it to win. I want to win. You know, I want to, if I win or lose, I walk off of the mat and I've learned something from that. And I'm like, okay, what can I do to apply this? That's when I go back to my note taking. I write all the notes down. So, okay, let's, what can we tweak? What can we make better? You know, what, what's something we could take out? You know, that's another thing people, you know, need to look at you know like Bruce Lee used to say you know hack away all the unessential that's that's the same thing it's like what can you do in what you're constantly improving on each week that you don't really need you know and as I've gotten older in the art I've hacked away hacked away hacked away it's like okay I don't need this I can do this this is what I need and I have a stripped down version of what I use every single day in all the arts that I do but uh but the competition side of that that it that that helps build that in a person you know um I know some people can't compete in ailments and things like that, but uh, just being around it, even if you have a team that you can go to and, and support, you know, watching the people go out there and compete, those people need you just as much as you need them, you know, and just the support alone behind that. It does wonders for your academy, you know, people bond a lot tighter that way. I agree. I completely agree. I, I think, well, competition can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. I think it's a tool. Going it to class is. is a tool. Competition is. is a tool. Training on your own is a tool. Reading is a tool. Listening to this show That's is fun. a tool that combined in the right portions leads you down your path. That's right. And sometimes, you know, you, you ever you ever had baked goods that left out the eighth of a teaspoon of salt? All right. You know, it's it's <laughs> such a small ingredient. But you get you get to the finished product and you go, 
doesn't taste right. right. And for some of us, competition is that. It's just right. it's a sprinkling. And that's okay. You know, that's completely okay. Because there's so many avenues you can go down for the martial arts that you can learn from. So it's just, it's just one avenue. It's not for everybody, but, and it's not, sometimes it's not for everybody all the time. You know, I mean, I haven't competed in the last year and a half, but that's okay. I mean, year before, the prior to that year and a half, I was on the road every single month fighting all over the world. So it's, it's not, I don't think it has to be all on or all off. You know, it's just, it is, is what it is. It's an avenue. And it's there for you if you like to choose it. Any good stories from competition or the road? Oh man, I've got a lot, a lot of, a lot of stuff that you can share. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's always, there's always cool things. I, I, t- I can tell you this though. Okay, people that are competitors, I guarantee it. Most of them don't remember the medal they won or the person they competed against. What they remember is, if you say like myself. You can say, Mark, you, know, you fought in Brazil. Yeah, I fought in Brazil three times. I can tell you about every single thing that happened on those three times I was there. But I can't barely remember who I fought. I don't even know. I mean, sometimes it comes in, but it's the experience of getting out there going, man, I, I've been all these different places that I can say I, I competed there, but – man, this is what I got to do when I was there. Like, I always wanted to fight in Rome. I thought it was the coolest thing. Like, man, it's like the Romans, you know, you go over there, you know, you fight over there. And I did that. I did that two years ago. And I um, I did well in the tournament, but I don't talk about that. I talk about what how cool Rome was when I got to see, you know, all the things that were there from 2,000 years ago. How cool is that? They don't have that in Texas. So it was, it was pretty, pretty awesome to be able to go and experience that and fight like a warrior and gladiator at that time. You know? But they let you keep your clothes on, right? They let you keep them on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if anybody knows their history. That's right. Oh, God. Well, this has been great. If, if people want to find you online, you mm-hmm. know, website, social media, I, I mean, I'm sure you perked up more than a few years ta- talking about this, this temple of martial arts that you're building. You know, how, would, how would people connect with you? Okay, so we have a website. It's ReddingMartialArts.com, and the last name is spelled R-E-D-I-N-G. Okay, so it's ReddingMartialArts.com, and it has both of my locations on there. It has our little bio and everything, and all of our our schedules and classes. Um, I don't have a. I I, I don't really do Facebook. I, I have an Instagram page. It's RMA Jujitsu, um, and you can go on and check it out from there. Um, we uh, we have a. It's not really Facebook, but it, it, you can access it through Facebook. It's a writing. You just type in writing martial arts on Facebook, and it'll pull up, and it'll show you, you know, what we, we each week say, what's going on, of the classes and pictures and whatnot, stuff like that. But um, the best way to really have all my contact information is on our website, and you'll see all the things you need to see there. This is where I give you the opportunity to kind of close it out. This is your okay. episode, your story. We're talking about you. So how, what? What final words would you want to leave the listeners with today before we roll out to the, the outro that I'm going to record? Um, you know, I mean, it depends on what kind of listener is listening to this. So if you're most of the people, it sounds like a martial artist. And, you know, I, I hope that my story, you can look, look at it and go, wow, man, you know, this, this guy took his passion and um, he ran with that. And this is what he's done with it. So I think people, no matter what it is, and a lot of people in their life, they find their passion towards the end of their life, and they always have a really quick excuse to say, oh, I got kids, or oh, I'm married, or oh, I can't do that, and it's too late, I'm too old. My advice to you is, like, if you find the look fortunate enough to find a passion like I found and feel so strongly about it, do something about it. Don't, don't wait. Don't uh, think you're too old, too young. Um, you know, I started my school when I was a white belt you know, in jiu-jitsu, and I heard all the way along, oh, you're just a white belt, you're just a blue belt, you're just a purple belt, you're just a brown belt, and, uh, and they don't want to talk anymore when you get your black belt. I, I, uh, I feel like so many people let that go, and they say, oh, I know, I, I, I'm, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. You can do that, and I, I'm proof that you can do it, and I never went to college. This is, this is all I've ever set out and wanted to do, and I believe that uh, a lot of people have that passion that's hidden in them. And if it's not martial arts, it's something else. But act on it, you know. Why short and try to try to go out there and see what happens. And one last thing, I'll, I'll say on this too. My one of my instructors told me this one time, and I I, I said, 
constantly and remind myself of it. He, um, when I was running my business, uh, I had, uh, when I first started, I had to work at other places because I didn't have enough students to be able to do it on my own. And he would call me almost daily, you know, at least a, a few times a week. And he would say, Mark, you cannot wait for all the lights to turn green. And he is 100% correct on that. And that, that's what I would like to leave with that to whoever's listening, whatever passion or thought you have in mind, do not wait for all the lights to, to turn green because they're not going to. You know, you've got to make those decisions. Back at the intro, I promised you positive and I promised you motivated. And that's what we delivered. Man, talk about an upbeat guy who just, who sees what the world has available, sees the opportunities. And I wasn't kidding when I said, I, I'm, I want to be first in line to travel down to this, this wonderful space that he's building. It sounds incredible. I love hearing about these unique and amazing, positive, wonderful opportunities, challenges, explorations of business and martial arts that are happening worldwide. We've heard about quite a few of them here on this show, and I hope we get to continue to hear about them. So. Thank you, Professor Redding. I appreciate you coming on the show and look forward to connecting with you in the future. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to find the show notes for this episode. While you're there, check out the other episodes, sign up for the newsletter, and think about supporting us, whether that's through our Patreon or making a purchase at whistlekick.com, use the code podcast15, or you know, letting somebody else know about the show or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever, Facebook, buy an Amazon book. There's so many things you can do to help us out. And if you get value from these shows, I hope you'll consider doing that. If you see somebody out there, you know, wearing some whistle kick stuff, make sure you say hello. They're part of the tribe too. And who knows, maybe you get a new friend or training partner out of it. If you've got guest suggestions or other feedback for me, I'd love to hear it. Go ahead, hit me up, jeremy at whistlekick.com. It's my personal email address. So thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.